Hi, I'm Joel, the team leader here at Whitley Bay Baptist Church. And our reading today comes from Ephesians 2, verse 11, through to chapter 3, verse 6. It says this. Therefore remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the human body by human hands. Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside his flesh, in his flesh, the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Since the start of this year, we've been studying the book of Ephesians together, and we haven't really got very far. We spent the first few weeks laying the groundwork, setting the scene, thinking about Paul's relationship with the church in Ephesus and what the city and the church themselves were like. We've considered the letter as a whole. We've acknowledged that the first half of the letter is Paul retelling the gospel story for that audience. He lays the theological groundwork for the second part of the letter, which is a practical outworking of what we believe. So we've been thinking about being adopted into the family of God, about being chosen by the creator to belong to him. We've been thinking about the inheritance we have as God's people, the hope we have as those who are saved, the power of God at work in those who believe. Last week we considered sin and salvation and that leads us to here, it leads us to this therefore at the start of our passage today. Paul's been talking about how Jews and Gentiles are both made in God's image, are his handiwork, his masterpiece. And now we are all lumped together and Paul wants to explain how that can possibly be. As in the past, there have been some very distinct and very important differences between Gentiles and Jews. I'm going to do something today that I rarely do, which is work through this passage pretty much from start to finish. It might help you to have a Bible or Bible app open in front of you. You can try and work out where on earth I am and attempt to judge how much longer I might go on for. We're starting at verse 11. And here, actually, in these first three verses from 11 to 13, it describes to us a division. The passage starts with a separation. On one side are the Jews, the circumcised, the descendants of Abraham, the people that God has chosen for himself and made a covenant with. He has promised to be their God and they would be his people. He would bless them and bless the world through them. He gave them the law to help them live as his people and he instructed them to circumcise their male children as a sign of this relationship. 
On the other side, you have the Gentiles, and that's everyone who is not a Jew. Some people are calling them the uncircumcised. And there's an attitude here that I think some Christians have, that people in the church, people who are not in the church, think that we have. There's a sort of judgmental superiority. There is a danger that Christians begin to feel morally or spiritually better than other people because we have Jesus, as if that gives us the right to look down on others. Of course, it doesn't. We haven't done anything to get to where we are. It's by the grace of God. But the, this idea of Jewish people calling Gentiles the uncircumcised has a similar feel to it, a looking down. And this separation between Jew and Gentile represents a difference in their relationship with God too. A difference between those who are the people of God and those who are not. And something here is not right. There is an inequality between Jewish followers of Jesus and Gentile ones. And that doesn't even touch upon the fact that um, defining who is in and who is out by circumcision immediately makes half of the population second class. But Paul makes it clear that just because someone is circumcised doesn't automatically make them morally or spiritually superior. He emphasises that even though this right has been given by God, this ritual has been given by God, it was done with human hands. He might have verses like Jeremiah 9.25 in mind, where God promises a punishment for those who are circumcised in the flesh, but not in the heart, who have the earthly symbol without the spiritual reality. Before the work of Jesus, the division between Jews and Gentiles was real. It was part of the way God had set things up under the law and there was hostility too for hundreds of years the major interaction between jew and gentile was uh, war was oppression was occupation it's no wonder that there is animosity here paul says that the gentiles were separate from christ because whilst jesus was a jewish man part of God's chosen people, the Gentiles are not. They have been excluded from citizenship in Israel and being part of the covenant with all its promises. Citizenship in the Roman world was important. It meant that you had the legal right for your children to inherit your estate. It meant that you had the right to make full use of the robust Roman justice system. Gentiles were denied the spiritual equivalent of this citizenship because of the law. Gentiles were without hope because they did not know of the great promises of God for this world, the promises of salvation and redemption, of renewal. They lived in a world where the gods they knew were fickle, selfish, fallible, where there was no great plan for the future, no hope. They were without God. Because they did not know the creator of the universe. And we know that in the early church, these differences caused huge arguments. Even in the church, there was this divide, this barrier between Jewish Christians and Gentile ones. The divisions ran deep. Law-abiding Jews could not sit and eat with Gentiles. It made communion quite difficult. They treated the Sabbath differently. They were separated by the demands of purity laws and sacrifices. It would have been incredibly hard for these two groups to live in community with one another, to be truly brothers and sisters in Christ. There's this whole thing in Galatians 2 between Paul and Peter, where um, Peter has been sitting with the Gentiles to eat, and then he goes to sit with the Jews to eat, and they talks about what customs each group should stick to, what you should adopt, what you should discard. The first major argument in church life was whether or not Gentiles needed to convert to Judaism to be Christians. Did they need to be circumcised and obey Jewish law? But, Paul says here in Ephesians 2, Christ Jesus has brought those who were far away, the Gentiles, near. 
one of the major metaphors that's used in the New Testament when talking about the church is the temple. Paul mentions it in verse 21 here, but the idea of temple runs through all his thinking. The temple was the place of worship, of sacrifice for the Jewish people. It was the place where God's presence was said to dwell among his people. This is where you came to encounter God. This is where you came to make sacrifices. And there were different parts of the temple. In the middle was the most holy place, the holy of holies, where the very near presence of God was said to rest, sat there on the mercy seat, which capped the Ark of the Covenant in which the Ten Commandments were kept. That place was separated from the rest of the temple by a huge, thick curtain. And only the high priest was allowed in and only once a year to make sacrifices for the people. Beyond that inner place was the place of the priests. And then there were courts for Jewish men and Jewish women. And then there was a court for the Gentiles. In the temple, there was literally a wall, a barrier separating Gentiles from Jews. When it came to worship God, the two groups could not gather together. It was forbidden. It was death for a Gentile to draw closer than they were allowed. And so when Paul speaks of Jesus destroying the barrier between the two groups, he's thinking of the temple. He's thinking of that separation which was enforced when people came to worship God. Under the law in the temple, there was no way that Jewish and Gentile Christians could come together, that these two different groups could worship together as one. But now Jesus has made a way. The law caused division. Its rules meant we could not be one. It would insist the only way for Gentiles to be included in the people of God would be for them to convert, to be circumcised, to join in in the old covenant. But Jesus forms a new covenant, not sealed by human hands, but by his own death. He sets aside the law, bringing peace. And the categories of Jew and Gentile now don't quite work in the same way as they did before. Jesus has forged one new humanity from two distinct groups. You might remember last week I was talking about what it means to be fully human, to be image bearers, to love God and to love one another. And that is being a key part of how we were designed to live. Well, now Jesus has made a way for our relationship to each other to be set right, for the barriers between people to be torn down, for us to be one in him, despite the many differences we may have had before. But he's done more than that. He has also torn down the curtain in the temple, separating all of us from God himself. When Jesus died on the cross, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. The separation from the most holy place from the rest of the temple was gone. A way was made. A symbol that there was nothing now preventing us from drawing into the very near presence of God. The writer to the Hebrews tells us that Jesus has made a way through the curtain so that every one of us can draw near to God. Now we can be united as God's people. No one need be excluded because of their race or their inability to keep the rituals and commands of the law. And we can all be united with God by the work of the Holy Spirit. We are now one people, united in Jesus, in and through him, citizens of the kingdom of God, members of the royal household. The things that once divided Jew from Gentile fade into insignificance in the light of the grace of God through Christ Jesus. We are built together into one new temple. Remember, the temple is the place where God's people come to engage in their relationship with him. Remember that togetherness, our relationships with each other and our relationship with God are what make us fully human. And so being the people of God, loving God and loving each other, being united with one another and with him is what God designed us to do and be. The temple was the touching place between heaven and earth, creator and creation. And now that touching place is here with us. 
When we come together in his name, we are the holy temple where God's spirit dwells. Now, there are no barriers in our relationships with each other or with God. There there are conditions. There is a response, a repentance, a faith commitment that's still needed from us. And we'll come to that in the weeks to come. This message, I think, must have been really hard for Jewish Christians to hear. Can you imagine being told that your deep held convictions and traditions no longer applied? That the thing your granny's granny's granny had taught her, the thing that had been passed down, was now changing. I guess it makes sense that many people, many Jewish people found it hard to accept that Jesus was Lord, to set aside those traditions and beliefs. But this isn't a problem that was just confined to one moment in history. This isn't something that the Jews in the early church had to wrestle with, but we don't. Throughout history, Christians have faced similar problems. There have been deep held traditions and beliefs in the church that have needed to be overturned after hundreds of years. Some of the things that the church had come to believe and was doing 500 years or so ago led to the Reformation. For nearly 2,000 years, most Christians accepted that slavery was supported by scripture. But that has changed, praise God. Not long ago, in the, um, the Baptist Union celebrated 100 years since the first woman was accredited and ordained for ministry. But that reflects the fact that prior to that, for most of Christian history, women were not allowed to be ministers. And most people for most of that time would have said they were simply obeying what it says in the Bible. And each of these moments in history have led to division and distrust among Christians, even violence to separation of God's people, to barriers going up. And I think it would be extremely arrogant for us today to think that everything we do and believe right now is exactly as God wants it to be. Because we have been shown time and again that sometimes we need to set aside what we believe and the old way of doing things in the light of God's revelation and fresh understanding of his word. To be the church, to be united as God's people, sometimes means having to have the humility to admit that we are wrong or that we might be wrong. It sometimes means sacrificing deep held traditions so that God can forge something new, just like the Jewish Christians had to do in the very early church. Being the church certainly means loving sisters and brothers who are different and think differently from ourselves. You know, I often wonder when the day comes when all things are made new and I'm chilling with Christ, I wonder what things I will look back on with regret. Maybe you don't have regrets um, in the new creation, but I wonder what beliefs there are that I hold on to now, the things that I say and do that will turn out to be misguided. I pray God will forgive me for those. I need to wrap up. I'm at the end of chapter two. I'm not going to go all the way through the first six verses of chapter three. I just want to touch on the last one. Chapter three, verse six, which says that we are all now heirs. We are all members of one body, sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus. I wonder if there are still any dividing walls of hostility in our church. I wonder what things might keep us from all being one in Christ, from being properly built into the God, into the God loving and each other loving temple that we are called to be. I'm not saying we all need to believe the same thing, but maybe to have the humility to understand that others perspectives and points of view may be as valid as our own. I wonder how we as a church treat those who are different from us. Maybe of a different race or gender or a different tradition, different nationality or social class. Those who might think or act or worship differently to us. 
Do we expect them to become like us? Do we expect them to conform to our ways? Or is there a new way ahead? Is there a blending which forges something new? I wonder what things, what beliefs and behaviours we as a church here are willing to humbly compromise on and which ones we choose to stand firm about. What are the foundations which we build upon? Once upon a time, Gentiles were foreigners and strangers to the people of God. Now together, we are all his children. I wonder who the foreigners and strangers are today.